Great Panther Mining, we have three operating mines, one in Brazil, two in Mexico, and we have a project in Peru, and our headquarters are here in Vancouver, where I am sitting at the moment. So we're a, a growing, we're a diversified producer of gold and silver in the Americas. The first slide that I'm gonna talk about is, is COVID, and this is affecting everyone literally on the planet. Um, we have gone through a, a wave of COVID in Brazil. Tucano was one of our first mines that got it. We're now back 100% employees who have had COVID are all back at work now. We did have to ship from an eight hour, sh eight hour shift schedule to a 12 hour shift. We're now back at eight hour shift schedule. So Tucano is back to normal. Mexico is also being affected by COVID as is Peru. But both our mines are working in Mexico under very strict protocols, basically learning from what we um, <clears throat> managed in Brazil. So Brazil was a bit of a learning process for us, but we are, I believe we're through that one now. But protocols are still rigor rigorously enforced because you know we, we are expecting a second wave as you know the rest of the planet. So COVID is a big factor but all our mines are operating right now. Q2, we issued our financial results and it was a, a really good quarter. You know, we had records in, in a number of respects. Um, we had um, record uh, net income, adjusted EBITDA, we had record production from Tucano, and we managed to produce 38,541 ounces of gold equivalent in the quarter. And that's basically on track to meet our full year guidance of um, around about 150,000 ounces. The revenue in the quarter was $67 million and we generated cash flow from operations of around $20 million. So a really strong quarter. The gold price, we. Uh, saw in the second quarter was around about $1,730. So we are expecting, um, you know, the gold price to, to stay where it is right now, you know, above 1900 and That will obviously affect our results significantly. The higher gold prices will benefit us, as will the high silver prices for our mines in Mexico. So Tucano is the, the big producer of gold in our portfolio. That produced 35,000 ounces in Q2. Um, that was a 35% increase over the first quarter. Uh, and, and it was, a, in fact, a, a record of gold production. Ginkana, the big focus there, and I'll explain it a little bit more in our later slides, is our exploration program. So at the beginning of the year, we authorized a $7 million exploration budget basically targeting to replace our resources and reserves of depletion from this year, and then start investigating our regional targets. And the Jakarta mine is situated in a very prospective um, iron, banded ironstone belt. And we believe that you know, the regions are very, very interesting to us. So we have started the exploration effort in the second half of the year, and I can update you a bit on that later on. The mines in Mexico, Topia and GMC had a good quarter. They were affected by the government mandated shutdown in, in the second quarter. So that did slow things down, but they came back online in June. They're still running now. And they had a pretty successful quarter, but um, obviously affected by the, the slowdown. But the, the silver price, has increased significantly, and this is obviously um, great news for our, our Mexican silver operations. So that's it for Q2. Then stepping back um, a bit, just looking at Great Panther, you know, what are our investment highlights? We're, you know, a growing gold and silver producer focused on the Americas. We've got a diversified portfolio of assets in Mexico, Brazil and Peru, all very established mining jurisdictions. And we're actively exploring uh, large land packages in very prospective districts, notably Tucano. 
We do have a mandate to grow, so we are looking at acquisition opportunities to complement our existing portfolio. The, the management at Great Panther has changed. Um, I, I came on board uh, about four months ago, along with um, Dave Garofalo, our new chairman. So we do have a strengthened board of directors, and we have a basically a, a new management team in place. So I'm pretty excited about our team. I think you know, we've I've certainly got who we need on the key um, <clears throat> positions. So the team I'm very excited about, and we're looking forward to delivering on our promises. Yeah. The focus for me, um, I, I'm an operations guy, I'm an engineer. Um, my, my focus is continuous improvement. So make sure the operations continue to get better in delivering the goals they're meant to be delivering and keeping the costs um, where they should be and at all times focusing on safety. The bottom line, Great Panther does have a very attractive re-rating potential. The slide five, basically a map of where our operations are. So again, focused in the Americas, Tucano in the north of Brazil. So <clears throat> we're in a very interesting greenstone belt there. Coricancha is our project down in Peru that we are looking at you know, um, doing some studies of how we can advance the mining rate there. We have a mill in place and the area is very interesting geologically. So we, we have yet to make a production decision there and that's still under evaluation. Guanajuato and Topia, basically silver producers in Mexico that have been running since 2005 very established districts and very um, reliable producers. The management and the board, myself CEO, as I, say, I came in in April. Uh, Neil Hepworth, our CEO, uh, um, very experienced mining company for over, over eight years and has a lot of experience in the in the industry so we've got a very good team in place here and i believe it's exactly who we need to drive this um the business forward the board also went uh, underwent a few changes in april so dave garofalo came in dave is the former president and ceo of gold, gold corp tons of experience um, at you know leadership levels of some of the best gold mining companies on the on the planet, so we're very excited to have David as our chairman, and he brought on Joseph Gallucci and Alan Hare, again very experienced guys in the business, who complement the board in certainly in in the, um, the the capital projects and the operations side. John Jennings has been on the board since 2012. Um, Jim Mullen since 2013. And Kevin Ross came in on 2019. That's our technical side. Elise Reese is our um, independent director in, in charge of the audit. And she has a long career with Ernst & Young and she's been on the board since 2017. So Bob Garnett, been on the board since 2011. So we have a very experienced board and very supportive of our plans to grow the business. The slide just demonstrates how we've changed in the last year. So in 2018, we were really a Mexican silver producer. Uh, most of our revenue came from silver. In 2019, we completed the acquisition of Tucano in Brazil and we changed from a pure silver producer to a silver and gold producer. And the, 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 the line basically shows the growth in the company in, in the fact that gold is now our big driver and we position ourselves as a gold producer. <laughs> our financial strength has increased significantly in the beginning of the year, we had cash 
equivalents of about 37 million. We're now at 60. So we, we managed to ride the COVID wave. We did do a financing on May the 20th for $14.7 million net proceeds, basically as a precautionary measure um, in case COVID got out of control. We seem to have ridden that wave out. So we're much more comfortable in our cash position now and we have positive working capital. So our financial strength is significantly improved from the beginning of the year. Exploration is our big focus. We are drilling in Mexico, we're drilling in Brazil. Um, Brazil is our, is our main focus, Ducano, and I'll go into a bit of those details now. <clears throat> So Tucano is an operating mine, open pit. It's located north of the Amazon. It was started off by Anglo-American and then Gold Corp. We had a heap leach for a small period of time. And then the Australian Bidel came in and capitalized the facilities with a very good sulfide mill. But Bidel struggled with, it, with the gold prices in the last four years. And we came in and purchased the company in the first quarter of 2019. So it has been operating. Tucano has been in operation for a while, but with mixed success, the, the heat bleach didn't work so well. Fidel weren't able to fully realize the potential because they were struggling for cash. So the land package is essentially unexplored. Um, the the focus <laughs> on the exploration right now is looking at the input to um, replace some of the near-term resources. We have an underground feasibility study that was completed several years ago by Vidal. So the future will involve underground, and that's going to take a bit more drilling. But the most interesting part is, is the district, and that's what we're going to be getting into in the second half of this year. The First half of the year, we produced 61,000 ounces of gold at an all-in sustaining cost of around about 1,300 ounces of gold. And the full year guidance is 120 to 130,000 ounces of gold. Um, so it is a, this is a big operation for us. It does generate most of our revenues. So it does take a lot of our attention. The land package. It's on the Guyana Shield. It's host to some of the world's largest gold deposits, as we can see in this slide here. And we believe this is the most interesting aspect of Tucano is, is the exploration potential. But first, we need to replace the reserves. So Tucano consists of a series of open pits over a strike length of about seven kilometers. And we have been focusing in the Tapabera pit um, the pits AB1 and AB3. And the target there is to convert the inferred ounces to a, an indicator status so we can get them into reserves at the year end and we can put them into the, the near term mine plan. So the, the target for this in pit drilling was to basically replace the 2020 depletions of so the, the 120, 130,000 ounces were taken out of it this year, we intend to um, replace that with this drill program. The regional program, we're going to be getting into this in the second half of the year. Where we are in Brazil, it's a pretty wet region, and typically the first half of the year gets a lot of the rainfall, so access into the terrain is very difficult when it's super wet. It's drying out now. So we've done a lot of the, the geophysics and the preliminary work. And we do start intend to um, drill our deposits um, very soon. The most interesting one is Mutum, which is about 20 kilometers away from the, from the mine. This did have some preliminary work by Bidel. Um, we plan to put some drill holes in it in the, and we'll see what the results are. Mutum is, is one of a series of about eight or nine targets that have been identified. And so we're very excited to get into these deposits. We did hire Nick Weiner. Um, he's our VP Exploration. Nick is based in Brazil. 
He spent over two decades working near this region and he understands it very well. And he's mapped out a very interesting program that we intend to you know, um, execute in, in, in the very short term. So Nick's very excited, we're very excited on this region. The underground, this was identified by the previous operators, Bedelm, and in, they did a pre-feasibility study in 2016. It's, it's the, 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 the mine outlined in the study has a reserve of about, of about 400,000 ounces, and the mine plan is around about 1,000 ton a day at a grade of around about four grams a ton, and that produces about 50,000 ounces a year. So the underground potential would supplement a mill, so the, the tonnage and the grade are, you know, are interesting, but they're not enough to fill our mill, which is a 10,000 ton a day mill. So we do need to continue our focus to look for more open pit. But the underground, with, with our reserves of around 400,000 ounces, it also has an inferred component of 800,000 ounces. So we have over a million ounces in this underground um, deposit. And we do intend to get some more definition drilling in the upper regions in the second half of the year so we can firm up our studies for going underground on Urukum North. The Mexican operations, Guanajuato is our, um, probably the most important one. It's a very, very established mining area. This has been mined for you know, uh, a couple of hundred years by the conquistadors in Mexico. It's narrow vein, it's high grade, and it's underground. So kind of just small. You can never really get a big drilled infantry ahead of you because you can only access the areas from underground. So it does take time to pull, but the area is extremely exceedingly rich and prospective. And in the first half of the year, we produced 527,000 ounces at an all-in sustaining cost of about $18 per payable ounce of silver. So this year, we do expect 1.2 to 1.3 million ounces of silver at an all-in sustaining cost of around $13 to $14. So it is an important cash generator for us, but it is, it's relatively small and it's relatively hard to explore, but the veins are consistent and we do believe this is an important contributor to our cash flow in the company. The other one in the Durango state is to the north of Guanajuato. Again, this produces um, <clears throat> gold and silver to make it concentrate. And the first half of the year, we produced 522,000 ounces of silver equivalent an all in sustaining cost of $19 per payable ounce. So the full year for Bukia, we do expect 1.2 to 1.3, so very similar for GMC. And the all in sustaining cost is a bit higher at $21 to $22. Cori <laughs> Cancha is located in Peru, 90 kilometers east of Lima. It is a brownfields area, it was mined for several decades. Um, the mine has been under care and maintenance for a number of years now and remains under care and maintenance whilst we do studies on, on what the best way to ad advance this project. But it does have significant um, resources. It has a mill in sight and we have to figure out what the best way is to re-establish the, the um, underground mining operation there. But we do think it has significant um, potential, particularly at today's silver and gold prices. We're getting into the, the capital structure of the company, our market cap in the order of $438 million. Um, pretty good trading volumes we've seen recently. And we are listed both on the TSX and the NYSE. And that is it from me. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, some uh, questions from our uh, participants online. One of them 
Um, specifically asking if you could talk about uh, the country risk you have between your, your three operations and, and what the history is like operating there. Yeah, I think you know, both Brazil and Mexico are very established mining jurisdictions. Um, <clears throat> Brazil, very good you know, universities, well-established law. So Brazil as a mining ju jurisdiction is, you know, is, is one of the best. Um, and, and likewise, Mexico is a very long tradition of mining. So you know, the government does understand that you know, mining is an important generator to the GDP of the country. So, you know, both Brazil and Mexico are, are very good jurisdictions from an operating mining point of view. Um, and likewise, Peru. You know, Peru is very reliant on its mines. So, you know, we, we do have a project there, but Brazil and Mexico, as jurisdictions go, you know, they, they've got to be amongst the top 10 in the world. <laughs> right. So uh, maybe you could talk a bit about Urkansha and um, what your, your next steps are going to be there. Uh, how do you view that asset? Is that something that you think potentially comes back on stream? It, it potentially, for sure. You know, Bob Archer purchased the property a couple of years ago. He saw the same potential in Cori Kancha that he saw at Wanawatu. So it's, it's underground, it's narrow veins, it's very high grade. There's established infrastructure there, there's mill, there's roads, there's tailings facilities, there's water, there's power. So it has everything going for it. Um, right now, Peru is complicated with COVID. You know, Peru, I think, is probably the most you know, seriously impacted of our three, three jurisdictions. So right now, you know, the, the place is on care and maintenance. Uh, access is, is difficult. So we, we aren't able to do as much work as we would like to because we simply, you know, uh, have got the place shut down. But we're certainly doing some, um, some, um, desktop work on mining rates where we would best access it. The, the, so the, there's a number of um, <clears throat> underground mines that are there. Where do we start mining first? How do we mine? At what rate do we mine? We, you know, we have a mill facility there that's rated over 500 ton a day. Um, so the problem is, you know, how do we fill that mill from the existing um, underground access? So that, that, desktop work is ongoing right now and pending the outcome of that will dictate whether we need to drill it a bit more in order to get a bit um, more confidence in our reserves ahead of us. So we, we are looking at, um, we're studying a, a restart potential. There. Right. So perhaps because of COVID, it's, it's not as big a, a focus as it might have been. It's definitely so things don't improve. There's no question. So yeah, our, our team's focus has shifted, you know, to you know, Tokyo, Wanawatu, and, and Chicago. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a question from a participant um, asking, "What gold and silver prices do you think you'll use to evaluate your resources at? And does it vary by property?" It it doesn't vary by property. Um, we use a consistent um, metal price across the board, and we're using a 1750 gold um, to define our resources and a 1500 gold to define our reserves. Mm. Okay. And and no plans on on changing that at present. No. Um, the 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 day to day cutoff grade, particularly from the underground mines, you know, we, we do keep an eye on spot, and so we are, are driven. Our cutoff grade strategy does rely on on spot quite significantly, but our reserves, you know, we we like to take a conservative approach to make sure we don't overcapitalize and, and spend you know too much money in, in the wrong spot. So from a cutoff grade, yeah, we we do. Take note of spot from a from a design purpose. We we use it on silver gold price. <laughs> right. You you talked a bit about the uh, exploration opportunity at Takano and and how regionally there hasn't been a lot of uh, exploration there. I think you mentioned uh, Matum was about twenty kilometers from uh, from the plant. Right. How far away 
would you consider a, a suitable trucking distance um, for you know potential resources you have in there? Uh, yeah, I think we're we are constrained by our, our tenement boundaries, and you know, I think the maximum is probably about thirty k's away. So I think you know anything in that area is is fair game in our existing tenements. You know, if some properties opened up a little bit further away, um, we, we'd have to look at it. The the area is compromised by some several big rivers. So I think there are natural kind of restrictions to <laughs> how far we can truck or before we start building, you know, major bridges and highways. But certainly, you know, Mutum and the, and the nine other ones are within our tenements and there's no um, restrictions to give access to them. So we would consider them all for sure. <laughs> right, I mean, uh, there, there's lots of instances of uh, very, very heavy rainfall in, in that part of Brazil. And as you think about going underground uh, there, is, is that something that uh, you're considering? It, it's not a major concern. It's you know it's it's a banded iron formation. It, it, it's there. There's the porosity of the rock is pretty low. So the water in the in the in the, the groundwater is pretty low. So you know surface runoff that can be managed pretty easily with, with sumps and pumps. So um, water water is not is not a big concern from an underground mining point of view. No. And, and you know there there are a number of mines underground mines in Brazil that have worked you know very successfully. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, question from a participant um, asking what you're spending annually for exploration um, and uh, for, for what kind of extra spending you need to put into the operations to sustain them. So exploration, we've got a budget of $7 million at Tucano. So that's our exploration spend, which we approved at the beginning of the year. Um, I think we will be, it's budget time coming up now, so the, the, the engineers and the geologists are putting together their plans, but I, I would expect a similar level going forward. I think it's a, it's a sustainable amount of money to spend on exploration in, in Tucano. Um, Mexico, you know, we, we do need to do exploration there on a continuous basis because of the very you know, difficult nature, so we've got a drill crew running pretty consistently. So I think we would, again, look at maintaining our budget in Mexico in the following years. Cori Cancha, that would be new, so we'd have to look at possibly increasing the exploration budget at Cori Cancha. But from a sustaining capex, you know, that most of our infrastructure is in place. Um, we would have to obviously look at doing some pre-strip at Tucano, um, depending on what the reserves come out at the beginning of the year. So we would be spending money on pushbacks at Tucano from you know, one or more of the seven pits that are there at Tucano. So sustaining CapEx, we obviously don't have the number for next year yet, but I would expect it to consist of some sustaining CapEx from pit pushbacks and exploration. <clears throat> Okay, uh, there's a, a question from a participant about um, the amount of silver versus gold. So I think it's, it's roughly three quarters gold for the company. Um, I have to do the math, but it's, it's most of our revenue comes from gold. You know, 80% of our revenue comes from gold. So certainly from a, a dollar's perspective, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a gold company. <laughs> Um, from an arms perspective, yeah, it's obviously uh, a little bit different because <laughs> silver is not as valuable as gold. But we we we, we see ourselves as a as a gold company. I mean, that being said, um, would you prefer to to look at gold assets or the silver that you're looking at? No, I I think you know, we we call ourselves a precious metal producers, so both gold and silver are very interesting. You know, we, we do have two silver mines, so we are very levered to the silver price. And, you know, I think we've seen the silver price start to get back where it should be. So, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about that. So we do have leverage to the silver price. So I do like silver. Um, so our Mexican operations stand to benefit from increasing the silver price. Um, so, yeah, I'm agnostic whether it's, it's gold or silver. But, as we stand right now, you know, gold is our primary metal. Sure. So when, when you look at your, your jurisdictions, 
outside of information around your your operations, um, obviously you're you're focused on the Americas. Um, are you are you looking at things in in Canada, or do you see more value in in Mexico and and Brazil and, and potential Latin American countries? I, I think the strategy is to leverage off our existing teams. <clears throat> so we do have a very good presence in Mexico. We have a very good presence in Brazil and Peru. So that will be the natural start of looking to leverage synergies. Um, Canada would be great, um, but we don't have a lot of operating experience in Canada. So, um, you know, as, as with the US, you know, we would certainly look at Canada and US, um, but we would start off looking at um, Brazil, Mexico, and Peru. Right. So despite the, the issues that uh, Peru has right now with COVID, you haven't stopped looking at potential acquisitions there for the time bit. You mind repeating that? You broke up a bit. All right. So despite the uh, issues uh, being in Peru right now with COVID, you, you would still like, consider looking at assets there? Yeah, no, I think Peru is a, is a great mining jurisdiction for sure. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's demonstrated that it has the geology. Um, it's, I think it's um, mining um, infrastructure is improving. We've got some of the biggest mines. You've got a government who recognizes the benefits of mining. So it, it is an improving jurisdiction for sure. So Peru, yes, we would certainly look at Peru. Okay. Um, now, the CEOs are never happy with their valuation and they're always, uh, undervalued. Uh, so I won't even ask you that. But when you look at other companies, um, what is a, a competitor company that you, you aspire to get more of a valuation uh, like they have? <laughs> Simple answer, all of them. We're, we're, we're below. <laughs> we're below all of them. I think for a number of years, we've been seen as, as a silver company. So we're just not on the radar screen as, as a, you know, what we are right now is as a gold company. So our valuation metrics you know, are, are really lower than all of our peers. So there's no single company that I think we aspire to, to be. But I think we do recognize that we need to grow to be recognized. We, we are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We, we do have a lot of the American investors interested in us. Um, the, our production at 150,000 ounces a year is, is probably on the low. So, you know, we do have a board mandate to see how we would get that up a bit. And we can only do that by acquisition. So, you know, we are. We are looking at you know M and A strategies of, of trying to grow the company to a little bit more of a you know 200, 250,000 ounce producer where we would have more visibility to institutional investors rather than the retail guys who are interested in us right now. So I think the strategy is to get you know, a little bit bigger than we are right now um, in order to get on the radar screen of the bigger companies. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that certainly in the past. You were viewed more as a silver company. You were more of a silver. Absolutely. And so there's a bit of a, a transition when that happens, um, and hopefully investors will start to to recognize that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you know, I think we we do need to get the story out there. Um, I think we we are a diversified company. We're not a single asset company, so we we have multiple assets. We're growing and we're producing metal at a time when metal prices are, are very good. So we, we are generating cash and it's, uh, it, it's, it's a good business. So I think we need to just get that news out there to the, the precious metal investors. Right. Um, one thing I, I don't think we covered at all was um, if you do any hedging on metal or currencies or, or, uh, or on uh, interest rates. We do not do any metal hedging. We do have a hedge in place on the Brazilian REI, which we took out last year to protect our costs. So we do have a um, an FX hedge on the REI, um, but apart from that, there's, there's no no other hedging. <laughs> and um, pardon me for for asking, but uh, your your debt position, I believe, is is quite small. 
our debt is relatively small and it's it's mostly short term as well <clears throat> so we are looking at you know how we would convert some of that um, most of that debt was inherited from Bidel so we are looking at um, improving our debt situation so we, we don't have a lot of debt and the the action right now is, is most of it's going to be retired you know by the end of the year or at least half of it so we are looking at you know maybe um, doing something with that debt to roll it over or you know, getting creative with our debt okay um, now I you mentioned you have a, a mandate to grow the company and and uh, that's that's exciting for shareholders, but um, do you have a, a time frame, or is the company, is the, the board of directors a little bit more flexible on on, on when you achieve your targets? Uh, you know, I think you you have to evaluate the options pretty carefully. It has to be a strategic fit, and you know, not all of them going to work. So you can't really set a, a timer to it. It's you've got to be patient. You've got to do the work. You've got to do the homework, and where you know there are there. There is a deal to be made, then you've got to make sure you're you're, you're part of that. So, no, there, there's no there's no deadline for that, but you know, there is a focus for sure. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, I I think that covers off uh, all the questions we had from uh, participants online. Uh, I want to thank you very much, Rob, for making yourself available to us uh, for this this webinar, and also to thank the uh, participants uh, online. Um, our next webinar for Red Cloud is tomorrow morning. I believe it's 7.30 a.m. with uh, Soul Gold. Uh, it will be hosted by our uh, CEO, Ms. Tatters, and will include um, Nick Mayer, the CEO of Soul Gold. So, uh, once again, thank you very much. We look forward to uh, watching the good results continue and hopefully more work for you and exciting things for your company. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your time.